the easiest and most effective way to have earned 25% CAGR from Microsoft since its 1986 IPO required you to hold through 16 years of no returns, 16 years of nothing. So for every 10% increase in options retail volume caused a 1% increase in idiosyncratic volatility. And idiosyncratic volatility is stock movements that cannot be explained by any financial model. It's noise. You know, it's erratic market movement that is just caused by the mere nature of humans. So unfortunately, if you are NVIDIA or Amazon or Apple or Tesla, you know, one of these companies that an, a naive options trader is going to be buying, you are contributing to the overall volatility of that stock even though all you're doing is buying options. The S&P 500 or the Standard & Poor's 500 is a big ball of 500 companies that are broadly considered representative of America Incorporated. This ball of businesses is the index that virtually every investor pegs their success annually and lifetime against. And I just want to give a quick word from our friends and sponsors at Vodafone Business. Uh, I used to think of Vodafone Business as only a reliable provider of mobile and broadband needs, but they're really stepping up to help Irish businesses grow and flourish in an increasingly digital world. So they now offer a whole array of digital apps from productivity tools and security solutions to IT support and even website builders. More recently, Vodafone have launched their VHub digital advisory service. With its new service, Irish businesses of all sizes can get free one-to-one -one digital support and advice tailored to their business by simply booking a call with one of the VHub digital experts on the Vodafone business website. Search Vodafone VHub for more information. Uh, Marie, Emmett, welcome to another episode of Stock Club. Good to have you both on. Um, we're going to go in a different direction a bit to what we usually talk about on Stock Club. So we're kind of ignoring the news a small bit. There's probably something that happened in the last two days about NVIDIA that's taking Twitter by <laughs> storm, but we're going in a different direction. So we're actually going to talk a bit more about long-term investing. So this stat I shared, with you, uh, I shared with you over Slack a while back there, it's basically, it was kind of jarring to see, especially because of what we do at my Wall Street and everything. So basically the average holding time for US stocks has fallen from seven to eight years in the 50s and 60s to between six and eight months between 2020, to 2020 and now, so in this decade, we'll say. So Emmett, you've always been, well, we've always been big backers of long-term investing at Wall Street, but, but, but perhaps we don't remind people enough about the benefits of it. So you've been doing this for what, 20, 25 years? Uh, actually a bit more, I'd say more like 26, but the first few years were a lesson in malfunction really. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like the that's, malfunction that's how you that's how you got the the pedigree is basically uh, yeah by doing yeah well do, do you know what i was talking to somebody once who works in venture capital he said I, i've spoken to a lot of people who work in venture capital and um they said to me he had founded a very successful venture capital firm and a very nice person and he said to me do you know how much it costs to train a junior vc and I said, no, how much? He said, between 10 and $20 million, because that's what they're going to lose in the first couple of years. And I thought, right, that's actually a very interesting way to look at it, uh, to use a venture capital word, interesting. When you yeah. hear it in, interesting from a VC, it's a kiss of death. But yeah, so the first few years malfunctioned, <laughs> I might say, because um, technology wasn't there. I mean, I lifted a phone to a broker in New York and I spoke to her and we had a relationship, which was lovely, but ringing New York, New York was expensive and the commission was expensive and the flow of information to me as an investor was expensive. But anyway, um, yeah, of course. And I also got started in the nineties, which was, uh, the build up to a bubble, but that's not what we're here to discuss, Mike. We're here to discuss long-term investing. Absolutely. And for someone that hasn't been investing for that long, you've reaped the benefits of it for sure. So like you said yourself, you've had 200 baggers, two separate 100 baggers. Mm -hmm. um, and like that's something a lot of investors might never have in their career. And all of that has come from long-term investing. So I want to give, I want to let you kind of pitch the benefits of long-term investing to our, to our audience right now. Yeah, I'll do that. I mean, I'm such an advocate uh, of long term investing. When I look at a stock today, I'm thinking I'd love to own this for 50 years, but I'm very aware of this kind of downside thing called human mortality. Um, but, you know, you can buy for generations. But 
I, I had a look just before the podcast and I, I did a quick Goog to find that at this moment, there are over 32,000 books listed on Amazon on the subject of stock investing. Um, and uh, they, they cover a variety of subjects from fundamental analysis and technical analysis and, you know, behavioral finance, index investing, value investing, dividend investing, growth investing, options trading, Forex trading, blah, 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 blah. Like there is no end of literature out there on, you know, the broad, broad topic of stock investing. And until I, I Googled it, I thought I'd read most of these books, but I haven't even nearly read 1% of them. I've at most on my shelf over the other side of my computer here about 200 books in stock investing. And I've really only read and properly absorbed about 60 or 70 of them. And uh, like 32,000 is absolutely nuts. And if you read a book a day for the rest of your life at 32,000, uh, it would take about 88 years to read all those books, a book a day without a fail. Anyway, we'll come back to that, I'm sure. But long-term investing is something that is good for the soul because when you basically take a long-term perspective, you can tap in to a more karmic self. You don't have to get bothered by news. You don't have to uh, participate as heavily in paying taxes. Of course, you pay the tax, your tax is owed, but hundred baggers do not happen quickly. They just don't. The average time for a hundred bagger to happen, according to Chris Mayer, who's, sub, who's uh, studied the subject extensively is 25 years. And um, what I would say is that the, the, there's two ways of looking at long-term investing. You can have a pile of anecdotes and stories, and I'm going to hit you with a few of those. And then you can look at big data, and I'm going to hit you with that as well. So I'm going to um, start off, I guess, with a simple fact, which is that the which is a statement, which is that the easiest and most effective way to have earned 25% CAGR from Microsoft since its 1986 IPO required you to hold through 16 years of no returns, 16 years of nothing en route to some of the greatest wealth creation in history. And that anecdote is repeated over and over and over and over and over with every stock, almost every stock that has done inordinately well. Like if I can elaborate, if you take, if you'd have bought Amazon, at or near its IPO, you would have waited well over 10 years for it to start to show the promise that we all know has been expressed uh, in the last 15, 20 years. Had you bought shares in Netflix, as I did in the early days, you would have had to wait well, well, well over 10 years. And it's easy to look at a graph mm. and see success and go, oh, well, look, had I bought back then at a book a share, uh, sure, I, and it's worth two hundred bucks share now. I, I, two hundred bagger, that's amazing. That, yeah. And it, a graph. Not, not is only, deceptive. not only would you have to wait that long, Emmett, in that ten years, but you'd also have to experience some severe drawdowns as well, and not so at those like fear, fearful moments. Horrible, horrible. In fact, I said to a member of the Horizon community recently on that very point that the real thing that got me hooked on stock investing was the observation, and I said it on this podcast before, so I apologize for saying it again, but um, what really captured my the full fury of my attention was the fact that Dell grew 1,600 fold, not 1,600%, 1,600% fold in the decade that was the 1990s. So had you bought two grand's worth of Dell shares on the first day of 1990 and held them till December 31st, 1999, that two grand would have turned into 3.2 million dollars, which is a life-changing amount of money. Well, for anyone, no matter who you are, that's a lot of money. And it was, I got completely obsessed with what was it Dell had back on the first day of 1990? What attributes did it have that I can look for in businesses today? And it's, that that I've spent my whole life looking for. And it was that mindset, I guess, that brought me to Tesla nearly as an angel investor, not too long after it and, and to Netflix in its very, very earliest days. So, um, and it's in fact, the, the methodology and the mindset that I bring to the horizon, uh, 
service, but not to go on about that. Really, you're 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 absolutely on the money. It's it's something in there you really need to allow vast amount of time to pass before great good businesses become great. And when you buy a business, you should at least carry a hunch that this thing is going to grow. 10, 20, 50 X. And if you're a growth investor, I should say, if you're a dividend investor or a value investor, there's a different approach. But if you're really looking for those kind of rockets that are going to augment your, your, your future wealth, you really have to go long. So anyways, as I was saying, they, you would have had to wait 10 years for Netflix. You'd have to, Nike, I mean, Nike, the, arguably the most wonderful sports uh, apparel company in the world, uh, 20 years. You could have bought Nike at IPO and had two decades of humdrum returns before it started to absolutely knock the ball out of the park. But this is a story not of cherry picking uh, uh, stocks that clearly have done very well because for every great winner, there's nine losers. I actually don't know the ratio, but you get my point. But this is really a 150 year old story. And that's where we start to bring in big data. And the exact summary of 150 year story is that um, Bob Schiller or Robert Schiller, economic uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, has has written a lot on the subject of stock market returns and investment returns and has analyzed it extensively. And taking some of the studies that he has conducted, the S&P 500 was only born in 1957. And I'm pretty certain most of our listeners know that the S&P 500 or the Standard & Poor's 500 is a big ball of 500 companies that are broadly considered representative of America Incorporated. This ball of businesses is the index that virtually every investor pegs their success annually and lifetime against. And the S&P 500 um, is a wonderful way to instantly diversify without any effort. And with the his, it, it, since it was, it, it was its inception and since it was founded in 1957, it has returned about 10 and a half percent compounded annual growth per year, which roughly means you double your money every seven years. So a dollar turns to two, two turns to four after another seven years and four turns to eight another seven years later. So you're doubling it every seven years. Um, but you can actually synthesize the method that companies enter the S&P 500 with backwards for 150 years. And Bob Schiller did this to see what is the probability of being down had you invested in the stock market at any point with 100 and actually I'm, I'm rounding up. I think there's about 148 years of data and listeners who are really into the uh, academia of this can go to GitHub and Google GitHub and uh, um, Zonation slash investing or look just Google GitHub. Uh, I, I won't go. I won't go there. But if you want to the big big data be behind what I'm about to say, just go to GitHub and look for uh, long term returns. But uh, it was found that the probability after inflation of being down after 25 years of investing in the S&P 500 with 150 years of data was zero, okay? No other asset class carries such certainty. So just to kind of break that down a little bit and start to go deeper on this data. So the probability of being down, if you're unlucky and start your investing life uh, in the S&P 500, which is the representative of American Incorporated, if you start at some really bad times, the probability of being down after 10 years is 11.8%. So you've about a one in nine-ish chance of being down after 10 years if you invest in the S&P 500 for 10 years. Mm -hmm. If we bring that up to 15 years, the probability of being down drops to 4 Point seven percent chance of being down. Uh, 1905, 1906, 1907, 1929. Most of these dates are really, really old. 1964, 65, 66, 67, 68, and 69. Had you invested in any of those years and held for 15 years, you'd be down. However, if you held for 20 years, the probability of being down, if you invested in the S&P 500, drops to 0.066 four percent and if you bought the s p 500 with a 25 year holding period zero chance zero percent chance that you will be down and when you take this big data and you start to extrapolate 
what it's telling us, which is by going long, by buying a basket of quality businesses and exercising some Zen temperament, you're, you're, you are absolutely putting yourself on the front foot. So, so what? Well, the so what is there's no other asset class with such historical certainty. And even when we just bring in 104 years of gold prices adjusted for inflation, I know our listeners love when I describe the shape of a graph. It's like, so, it's just the way I do it. It's lovely. I have a lovely way of doing it. Sometimes I say to everyone, now imagine a V, that's its stock. Or sometimes I say, imagine a W and everyone goes, oh yeah, I know W. Well, if you imagine the inside of a shark's mouth, that's what the price of gold looks like. It's just, it's, it's this horrible shape of up, down, sideways. It's with 104 years of data, you look at the S and P for uh, since 1957 or synthesized. It's a beautiful upward slope. It looks like, you know, the Han and Cam in Austria, in the other direction. It's just a lovely. <laughs> <laughs> well, you need to have a button to cut you off when you go on describing graphs. It's like the third right? Time okay, Amory, what, what were you going to say? What, my question Amory, was: like describe a Venn diagram yeah, by any chance? It's two circles, and they overlap, and there's a bit in the middle. No. Um, yeah. My question was, this is like a single instance of investment as well, right? It's like, mm. oh, you put in money at the peak in 2007 once. It's not even taking into consideration mm. that most investors, you know, might do a, a monthly or a quarterly top up, in which case their dollar cost averaging probably mm. greatly reduces their wait time. You know, if you yeah. only put in money in 2007, you might be waiting 15 years. You put money in in 2007, but then again, 2008, 2009, it's likely yeah. Yeah. halves the amount of time. Yeah, you look at how favorable that data looks towards long-term investing and then consider that it takes the absolute extremes into account. Like if you're in investing at the peak of the dot-com bubble or <laughs> January in 1929 or wherever else, you know, it's like mm. that that's the point where you lose money over 20 years. So on average, mm. it really does favorable. It really does favor holding on for the long term. So there's a lot of different ways of approaching long-term investing, but I think one very unique way of visualizing it is the coffee can portfolio. I mean, this is something mm. you talked about in the past. Yeah, actually, I think, did Chris Mayer come up with this? I know I'm, I'm constantly referencing uh, it's, Chris it's, at the moment. It's in the 100 Baggers book. I don't think it's an original it concept, is. but I don't is want to be ben quoted Green, on that either. Is it a Ben, a ben Graham book? But the basic um, premise of that is that you, you take your stock certificates and you stick them in an old coffee can. It's clearly a very dated concept. When's the last time I saw? I don't know if coffee comes in cans. Mine doesn't. Yeah. Does yours? Uh, I think the stock certificates are aging it more than the can of coffee. No, 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 never mind that. I'm still, I'm actually <laughs> obsessed on the coffee can. Uh, at least I've seen the stock cert. But anyway, yeah, and I think I think Chris says something about you buy a basket or a pile of stock certs, stick in the coffee can and you bury it in your garden or something like that. But I mean, the, the premise is that you really go long and you leave it there. And I think most people who... Um, are lucky enough to have a family and have elders in that family will be aware of an asset in that family that somehow just turned out to be worth something. You know, it could be your great grandmother's engagement ring, or it could be a piece of art that your, your grandfather bought for, you know, uh, a penny, halfpenny, farthing, shilling or whatever the old fashioned currency was. And now it's worth a lot of money, but the cough can portfolio is really, it's a concept designed to take the stress and pressure out of of investing and there's a lot of pros to long-term investing i mean apart from the fact that they re it really is a it's good for the soul if you ask me it also has compounding will only express itself compounding returns really only happens when we bring that big data that's out there in github and start to superimpose it on those anecdotes like nike and netflix and and, and tesla and so on really the only secret ingredient is sitting and waiting. Don't let those short-term bumps knock you off your perch. And coming back to that Dell example, where Dell grew 1600 fold in that 10 year period, there were at least three incidences where Dell stock fell 50%. And I remember it very clearly. My my uncle living in New York, rest his soul, I remember he, he had bought Dell and it fell 45% in around mid to late 90s, maybe 96. And I remember being on the phone to him and he was going to sell. And I remember, I mean, I was quite young. It was early twenties, I guess. And I was like, maybe you should just hold it. And he was spooked and he sold and sure that was not the right thing to do. Apart from 
time expresses compounding returns. You mitigate market volatility by just sitting and waiting. You defer tax events. I mean, depending on where you are and what part of the world you're in, some countries incentivize you with capital gains to hold on to your shares for more than a year. That's not the case in Ireland. It's 33% CGT, capital gains tax in America. It, it drops a couple of percentage points near the low 20s. What's it at, Anne-Marie, CGT? 20 if you hold more than a year. Yeah, exactly. So it's tax efficient. And then you also have, well, it's a little bit of an old world thing to say, but transaction costs. Uh, if in the world of Robin Hood, Robin Hood and Drivelt by Wall Street and Revolut, you don't really have to pay much commission. Um, there are costs, but let's not go there. It's another podcast. But there are many reasons why I just set it and forget it buy it and forget about it. And and a great mindset for long-term investors is as soon as you buy a share, act as if you never owned it in the first place. That's the real kind of, just for me, it's always been a little hack. As soon as I bought shares, which I've done with frequency my whole life, as soon as I've done it, I've almost said, right, I don't have that anymore. And that yeah. that's quite a, a strong mindset. Buried, buried in the coffee can in the back of the garden. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Um, So there is one kind of, not glaring issue with this mindset, but you know, Warren Buffett said that his favorite holding period is forever. And ideally you would always hold a stock forever mm. because you never have a reason to sell it, but that doesn't take into account the realities of investing. So the big question yeah. I think I have to finish this section on is when is the right time to sell? Because holding forever can't be this unbreakable, unbendable rule. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we are, we invest, we humans invest because we, what is, the, what is an investment? Investment is deferring a pleasure today in anticipation of a bigger, better pleasure in the future. So whether you invest in your body with a gym or your brain by going to university, what you're actually doing is you're taking a pain now in anticipation of being, um, better, more enlightened, fitter, wealthier, whatever the correct word is, more spiritually enlightened, whatever you're investing in, you are basically um, getting behind the concept of the future you. So what is an investment? It's deferring something today in anticipation of something bigger in the future. And what good is that if you decide, hey, I'm 24, I'm going to buy shares in CRISPR therapeutics, I'm going to leave them to my kids. It's, it's nice. But it's not as exciting as I'm going to buy shares in CRISPR therapeutics and on my 48th birthday, I'm going to buy an island and I'm going to build a casino on it. So <laughs> like we do have to really crystallize, uh, depending on, on your taste, <laughs> you want to crystallize the benefits. So, of course, buy it and never sell is a very simple rule. And I think we um, as creatures are best left to a handful of simple to follow rules. but the devil is in the detail and we do need to realize that there comes a point where you will need to sell there's other things to take into consideration that a stock or a, a, a business that you've bought if it's gone bad it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to recover and we used to say or i used to say on in the old days before uh religious uh idioms were <laughs> frowned upon but there's no angels on wall street which is the only person who remembers what you paid for a stock is you well and hopefully your broker um but uh like so if you bought a share in acme bricks at a hundred dollars and it's now two dollars in your mind as a cognitive bias this thing owes me 100 bucks a share it has to grow 50 fold back to where i bought it in order for me to get out and i'm not selling until i get out and that's a very deceptive cognitive bias because maybe you're better off taking that two dollars and moving it to the left so there's a lot and i mentioned all these books that are out there in the subject of stock investing and of the ones i've read there's a mosaic um in all of them about when you should buy i mean all of them basically tell express in different ways you should buy it when there's clear when you believe there's upside and there's different methodologies of um identifying what upside means whether it's paying tons of dividends or it's at the forefront of a cutting technology or fundamentally to use benjamin graham's coffee or what do you call it a cigar butt uh, example that there's still a bit of value in it which is a disgusting example if you ask me but there's all these things and they're all basically saying you buy something when you believe there's upside in it however when it comes to the subject of when should you sell um 
it's very dissonant. You don't get a huge alignment between some of the greatest master investors on when you should sell, and they all have different um, viewpoints on that. But to bring it back to the investor, the most famous investor of our times today, uh, Warren Buffett, he says, and this is the one I live by, is you sell a stock when you wouldn't buy it today. And one of the things that I do, um, specifically in the Horizon portfolio, is I keep a tracker on a weekly basis of would I put $10,000 into this stock today? Because if the answer is no, I wouldn't buy it today, you are actually moving to the sided room where it's probably inverting your thinking to say, well, maybe I should sell it. If I wouldn't buy it, then why do I own it? Um, and there, there, so you, there's a lot of hacks you need to get into your own mind to actually make sure you're not pegging yourself to some cognitive bias. So the, the truth is you would buy, you sell a stock when you wouldn't buy it today. And I have been tested along the way with Netflix and also Tesla. So they're my two biggest winners. I, I sold Tesla, um, a lot of my Tesla shares over the years to do this and that, to buy something else that I preferred. And thankfully I didn't sell them all because the few I left behind have augmented uh, my situation. But um, but the, the point I suppose is that you sell something when you wouldn't buy it. And even though you might listen to that voice doesn't necessarily mean it's right. Mm, yeah, I get that. But I think being fully certain that something that you believed about that stock or that business has materially changed, I think is, is, is distilling that there. It's like, well, this isn't why I bought it. And I don't think it's going to get back to those reasonings, you know? Mm, mm, um, exactly. Yeah. And Marie, I'm going to move to you now and just talk about why there's been this shift from long-term investing to much more short-term oriented investing. So what do you think has been the main driver behind that for people? Um, well, I think actually initially it was maybe caused by the bit of the stock market frenzy we saw in 2020, you know, a bit mm. of a combination of hype and panic. And usually anytime the stock market is in the news, people feel the need to get involved because they feel left out and everybody's talking about it. And that actually mimics a lot of consumer behavior that we've seen before. In, you know, 1977, the average holding period for a U.S. stock was about five years. In June of 2020, that dropped to five and a half months. Uh, it's quite a dramatic change. And, you know, some of that is down to macroeconomic conditions because in the middle of 2020, we had almost a 0% interest rate and there was a lot of stimulus money floating around. You know, There mm. was money to be put into the market. There was money the, burning and, holes in people's pockets. And there was time as well. Lots oh, of yeah. people were sitting, doing nothing, finding a yeah. new way to kind of just, just spend their day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 100%. And perusing like Reddit or TikTok or whatever way that investing kind of came to them. Um, you know, but it's, it's, we kind of see a similar thing has happened over the years. You know, the previous record low uh, for holding was six months, and that was hit right before the 2008 financial crisis in 1999. The holding period dropped sharply to 14 months, and that's in the run-up to the dot-com bubble. So again, like if the stock market's on the mind, people are going to be trading, and they're going to be trading irrationally because, you know, if you, if you think about like the way Wall, Wall Street Bets runs on Reddit, it's every day they're discussing 10 new stocks. So I think people just get a bit of FOMO, and they kind of jump yeah. in and out of stocks really frequently. But I think the more long-term question here it all has to do with technology and all has to do with access because the most lasting change is going to be created here by the fee fee brokerages that we really saw begin to rise in about 2018, 2019. And that really just gives anyone the opportunity to buy whatever they want, whenever they want from their phone, which is just an insane amount of movement to happen. You know, like Emmett is sitting right in front of us and he's like, oh yeah, you just have to call a broker and yeah, ask her to buy something on my behalf. Post, <laughs> like, post, post me out stock certificates and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like that's crazy. Now I can, you know, we can go on Revolut and you can buy a stock in 15 seconds. It's done. You don't have to think about it again. Yeah. Um, and that has led to like a huge jump in trading volume. And interestingly, we saw a really similar jump um, back in 1966, which is when the stock market was became fully automated, the New York Stock Exchange. And that was a huge technological leap forward. All of a sudden, it meant that trades could be executed significantly faster and also for way less money. So then once the technology was there, firms are going, how can we utilize this technology to the best of our ability? How do we make money? And that meant that we saw high-frequency trading appear, HFT. And today, high-frequency trading represents like 
50% of the trading volume in the United States. But oftentimes this type of trading is computer run. You know, these are huge firms with billions or trillions of dollars. So when they shift money around, that's not a ripple. It's a, it's a title. It makes it mm. a huge impact. Um, and now we're basically seeing the exact same thing, but it's consumer facing. Um, you know, back in 1987, daily average trading volume is 500 million. In 2020, it hit a billion. And a lot of this is being credited to individual investors having access. Um, individual investors today represent 25% of trading volume, and that is up from 13% in 2019. This is a significant acceleration over a really short period of time. And that it just shows how many people are involved in the stock market today. You know, we go back to the 1920s, right before the Great Depression, only 1% of the American population owned a share of anything. Um, and today that's at 50%. So 50% of regular people have some sort of foot in Wall Street. Um, and of course, you know, we have to, I guess, acknowledge 1920s, a lot of people did not have the money to participate. And of course, you know, if, if Emmett's life was complicated trying to buy shares, I'm sure in the 1920s, it was even worse. It probably involved like shouting on a street somewhere and I don't know, <laughs> yeah. like, fighting. I think you had <laughs> to drive clear. to Wall Street yourself and go in and find yeah. someone. Did you get a, like a horse? I don't know, a bit unclear. <laughs> um, but I also think it is uh, worth mentioning something else that Emmett said is that on top of just having the technological ability to buy the shares, we have way greater access to information because of the internet. You know, I think I can get really detailed write-ups of companies or I can get all of their financial data they've released by just going to their investor relations page on their website. That takes 10 seconds. I can get a massive 50-page file to sit down and read it. You know, that's a huge innovation that's only really happened kind of in the last 10 to 15 years. And we have consumer-facing stock and analysis services, you know, the success of The Motley Fool shows that people are interested and willing to pay for stuff like this. Even services that we have ourselves like Horizon shows that, you know, people are interested in buying individual stocks and they want their hands held, they want advice, they want a place to discuss these type of things. And then kind of, as I mentioned at the top, I think a huge accelerant of this is just social media. You know, if we say in 2008 or in 1999, a huge uh, reason people got involved in the stock market was FOMO from the news cycle. Now we have social media, which means the news cycle is 24-7. It's going all of the time, which means you probably have 20 times as many stocks that you're going to hear about and feel sad that you're missing out on. And so we just have this unstoppable kind of news cycle going around and round and round. So I think it's really a combination of just technology. And then it's that cycle of the technology gives you the ability to do so. So then you go and talk to people about what you should be buying. And then you go, oh, it's really cheap to buy stocks. So you just go round and round and round and round. Yeah, it's a yeah. flywheel. And you mentioned FOMO there. I think FOMO is a big influence on these higher risk strategies that have become so much yeah. more commonplace recently with especially options trading, but like crypto as well falls completely into mm -hmm. this too, where everyone's looking for that quick book. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And it's, um, actually kind of interesting because I think like the first episode of Stock Club I was ever on was because we'd seen a massive surge in options trading and a number of people had had credited it to TikTok um, because anytime you would like put investing in to TikTok at the time, most of the largest videos were coming from people who regularly traded options. Um, and I actually think that TikTok has since put in place financial regulations where you're really limited in what you're allowed to say now on the platform, which is quite interesting. Um, and so I ended up having to dive in and do a bunch of analysis to find out what's going on with the options. Um, but as of right now, today, we see about 40 million options contracts be traded daily. That's up from 15 million in 2010. And we saw less than 2 million be traded a day in 1999. So again, a significant acceleration. Retail investors account for more than 25% of total options trading activity, which is huge. And that has fully been spurred on by places like Robinhood, where options trading is now effectively free. Um, and it's kind of messing with some of the stuff that is exposed to options or exposed to options volatility, I guess you could say, because these are like regular everyday people who, yes, they have access to information, but they're probably not like hooked up to the Bloomberg terminal and doing like high, you know, analysis. It means that the na the biggest names associated with options trading right now are Tesla, Apple, Amazon, and NVIDIA. They make up 20% of all single stock options tradings today. So this is really just regular people going, yeah, Apple's a good company. It could go up or go, go down, whatever. We'll short it. Yeah. Um, interestingly, there's also a pretty... Unfortunately, there is a, a, a. It's pretty clear that most individual investors who are trading options are doing so in a risky way and in kind of like a, a an unrealistic way. They're using the most basic strategy, which is they're buying a single options contract at a time. They're doing a put or they're they're um, they're doing a call. That's all they're doing. But that's actually not really how institutional investors use options. Um, you know, if you go into any kind of uh, 13F, which is what a hedge fund uses to report their positioning, you will see that at any one time, they will have both calls 
and puts on a mm. single entity because they're hedging. They're using them yeah. to hedge and they're putting like tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars on these types of things. They're not buying single options contracts. That's not what they're intended for. Um, and and, and that think, means that, you know, I think that's sorry. a really good point, though, that these are incredibly complex and complicated financial products that are not being used yeah. to purpose. So as you said, they're hedges, mm -hmm. people are selling covered calls. It's it's kind of part of an overall portfolio strategy. It's not for someone to mm -hmm. go, I think Tesla is going to kill the next earnings. I'm putting, yeah. I'm gambling on it, basically. Yeah. And that means that like 11% of Robinhood users, monthly active users right now are buying options, but they're only buying single options at a time. Less than 1% is buying multiple at a time, which is what you would kind of need if you wanted to do an option spread, which is, you know, a bit more assurance and way less risky. Likelihood of losing everything is way less. Like, Oh, it's just it's it's very risky. And and that has actually meant that uh, John Foley, who's the CEO of Options AI, has this great quote where he says, everybody in the business knows that if you're only buying out of the money calls, then you're likely going to lose money over time. The question of democratization shouldn't be, can I trade options, but can I have straightforward access to the option strategies that Wall Street uses? The playing field is not level right now, and no one is really focusing on that. Hmm, absolutely. And I imagine a lot of Wall Street would want to be on the other side of those trades because options are yeah. in some form zero of some game. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So let's just finish up this section with kind of going to the downstream effects of people having mm -hmm. this much greater access to financial markets and financial products and all the rest. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because we're we're living it right now. Like it's you know as as I as I said, this is really new change. Like Robinhood only introduced fee fee trading, I think, back at the end of two thousand eighteen. It's only twenty twenty three, so that's like five years. Emmett was going around doing a statistical analysis of one hundred and twenty years of the stock market, and we are here trying to be like, this is what we know. We can make long term <laughs> conclusions from five years this, of data. This is the future, old man. Listen up. Yeah, yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there <laughs> actually, me. there has been a recent study that was done that is interesting. Um, it's called a real cost of free trades. Retail option trading increases the volatility of underlying securities. It was only published in March of 2023. Uh, it's a big full analysis. The team essentially focused on the period of when Robinhood introduced fee-free options trading. They took six months. They said, okay, we'll analyze the three months before and the three months after and see what that has done to these stocks. And not surprisingly, volatility increased, um, more so for stocks that saw greater increases in retail options trading. Naive traders are more likely to move in a herd, leading directly to volatility in the markets that they trade in. So for every 10% increase in options retail volume caused a 1% increase in idiosyncratic volatility. And idiosyncratic volatility is stock movements that cannot be explained by any financial model. It's it's noise. You know, it's erratic market movement that is just caused by the mere nature of humans. So unfortunately, if you are NVIDIA or Amazon or Apple or Tesla, you know, one of these companies that a uh, naive options trader is going to be buying, you are contributing to the overall volatility of that stock, even though all you're doing is buying options. And interestingly, the team found that th because individual investors are so focused on options, because they're participating so much, particularly Robinhood users, they're making the short term stock market more volatile. Whereas even if they were doing erratic day trading of just regular shares, they wouldn't be contributing so much to erratic movement. So as of right now, the conclusion is things are going to become more volatile in the short term. And that is because there is an obsession with options trading, which again, we have to keep in mind, like not all the blame here should be placed on the individual investors because Robinhood only really makes money when people buy options because the whole basis of the fee free model is the only way to turn a profit is through, what is it? Um, Payment for order flow payment for order flow and you only make anything off payment for order flow with massive volume and you make way more if you're doing something risky like a, an options trade hmm, and so an, an options uh, each contract is covering 100 yeah. shares as well so I, yeah. I assume that feeds into everything yeah yeah so they make i think it's like 10 times the amount of money so this makes no difference to robin hood they want people to trade options and they want them to buy them every single day so it's this combined thing of, of robin is desperately trying to make money people want to make money and they're surrounded by all of these gurus on tiktok who are like well the only way to participate in the market is is to buy 24-hour put options yeah. um 
and that there's a really wonderful quote on this um, from Larry Swindor, who's an investment analyst and he's a financial author. He's put out like 10 books all about like long term investing. And he says, while the new generation retail investors are tech savvy, they are nonetheless uninformed amateurs who act more like gamblers and casinos than investors in capital markets. The result is that the options trading is highly unprofitable for them, but highly profitable for the wholesalers making markets in the options and paying for the order flow. Forewarned is forearmed. Um, so it really is kind of interesting. You know, we have all this like new technology is giving people incredible access, but it, it is in some ways just kind of doubling down on Warren Buffett's strategy of there's a lot of noise in the market. Probably if you're an individual, the best thing to do is just buy and hold yeah. and hold through the noise. Yeah, I think that's going to be the kind of the motto to take away from all of this, uh, hopefully. And, I, and you'd hope to see, I know Robin Hood is, isn't the only one in this game, but like more, you have to qualify to mm -hmm. prove you have financial expertise to buy options because it is a more complex yeah. financial product. That's clearly not being done right right now. So hopefully we'd see no. more come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Um, right. We're just going to give a quick promo to our newsletter, Charging and Fearless. So each week we're delivering one of the most unique products on the market and it's completely free. So no one else is covering the markets we cover with Charging and Fearless where we deliver to you a new weekly stock pitch. Could be from Amsterdam, Tokyo, Paris, somewhere in between. So that's a completely free stock pitch every week. You'll read it in about 30 seconds flat and we can almost guarantee most of these companies are going to be brand new to you, which is where you get an edge. Sign up in the show notes for today's episode. Right, we're staying with the kind of long-term investing theme of the episode here. So it's not going to go big deal or no big deal. We're going to do a bit of like an advice corner instead. So Emmett, I have you up first and I just want to know what's the most beneficial book or any kind of literature that you have found helped your investing career. Okay, I have an answer because I know you slacked me the question about a half an hour before we started, so I grabbed it off my t my my <laughs> my shelf, and I'm going to go. Mm, let me think about it, and then I'm going to hold it up, and people will go, "How did he have it to hand?" Um, so uh, you know, there's there's a lot of books that are regard. So the the book that had the greatest impact on my investing life was a book about investing. You'd never think of it, think of it, but it actually was. Like, I mean, what book had the biggest impact on my guitar playing well it was a book about guitar playing so um i'd love to kind of draw from something very intellectual yeah, like yeah absolutely. human all too human by Salad, Nietzsche a or whatever, collection but... of dali <laughs> paintings or something really made you see through the, the collective mist. short stories of guy de mapazon absolutely <laughs> wonderful um so anyway the uh <laughs> anyway, like there's a load of books out there and as i said what thirty five thousand that would take you 88 years to read and it's absolutely preposterous but there's a generally regarded short list of five that um, you'll often see are constantly being referenced as the greatest investment books ever written. The first is The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. And I would say you have to be a very intelligent investor because it's a tedious read, although there's a version with footnotes by Jason Zweig, which make it far more readable. Um, common Stocks and Uncommon Profits by Philip Fisher, wonderful book, very readable. Um, a Random Walk uh, Down Wall Street by Burton Malkiel, a, a great book, very readable. Uh, Stocks for the Long Run by Jeremy Siegel, or Siegel, Professor Jeremy Siegel. One of my favorites, it's almost always on my table because it has basically a short explanation with a little bit of data on every term you're ever going to encounter in stock investing and i think it's the book I, everyone should have and then the the go-to bible which is one up on wall street by peter lynch which espouses that we all have an edge on wall street i i'd imagine one up on wall street was the one that had the greatest uh impact on my investing life from a I can relate to this perspective, mm, yeah. but I would say the book I most dip into is this one here. Can, can you see that? Do, 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 do. That is, is okay. Of Warren Bur the essays of Warren Buffett, it, is it? That's right, exactly. It's the essays of Warren Buffett, Lessons for Corporate America. And it's the essays of Warren Buffett, funnily enough, and it's compiled by a, uh, a professor of business and law called Lawrence Cunningham. And I dip into it and despite its really bland cover, it's actually colorful and enriching. And it is a wonderful collation of Warren Buffett's essays. And, uh, and therefore it's a document or documentation rather of his and Charlie's and therefore 
Berkshire's investing philosophy, and it's so readable. And now I have the 2001 edition, which means that um, there ain't nothing in it that's more than 22 years old, but it's still written uh, with a turn of phrase and I suppose a verbal dexterity that just keeps it so fresh. I think it's a wonderful book and, and hats off to the guy who wrote it. And do you want to hear something? Um, uh, do you know the blurb uh, that you get inside a cover? He managed to get Charlie Munger, uh, who is probably the most, how would you say? Um, old. Like, well, he's the <laughs> oldest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. He's very frank. But like you heard my story about him eating the Reese's the peanut um, brittle. The mm. butter brittle. Like so anyway, Charlie Munger is to the point, but he wrote a blurb and you know what can I read it to you? Have you time? Because we Please. can edit it out. It's a bit Go short. On. It's a bit long. <laughs> very practical, Charlie Munger. That's the entire <laughs> blurb. <laughs> the most practical guy of all time but he's known him he's like known him for 60 years as well Eric. <laughs> yeah that's right yeah, exactly. now uh, Warren Buffett I guess wrote the book but didn't compile it and it's the, the compilation that makes it so kind of readable and nice thing about this particular book is that you don't need to read it in linear fashion you can just let it fall at any page and just read a, a, a page from it and it will bring value to investing life but do you mind if I just pause for a minute and read to you um, the writing a short excerpt from the 2012 Berkshire Hathaway uh, shareholder letter is written by Warren Buffett because it's possibly my favorite thing ever written about the stock market. And it's only two paragraphs. So I'm really summarizing here. I'm summarizing a summary to a summary. Uh, I have it here on my screen. It says, today the world's gold stock is about the, so Warren Buffett wrote this. Okay. So I'm just going to, this is a lovely way of, of crystallizing the, pursuit of stock investing. Okay, he says, today the world's gold stock is about 170,000 metric tons. If all of this gold were melded together, it would form a cube of about 68 feet per side. Picture it fitting comfortably within a basketball field. At $1,750 per ounce, gold's price, as I write this, it would value it to be about $9.6 trillion. Call this cube pile A. Now let's create pile B, costing an equal amount. For that, we could buy all of the US cropland, which is 400 million acres with output of about $200 billion annually, plus 16 Exxon Mobiles, the world's most profitable company at this time, earning more than $40 billion annually. After these purchases, we would have $1 trillion left over for walking around money. No sense in feeling strapped after, buying, after this buying binge. Can you imagine an investor with $9.6 trillion selecting pile A over pile B? So when you think about alternative assets, and that, that's it, and he, he elaborates on how gold does nothing. It has no, it has a couple of um perceived value points, uh, I suppose, cosmetic jewelry and uh, some limited applications in medicine. But gold is ju literally just an element. And mm. somehow we, humankind, have decided its value because there was once upon a time where it was absolutely the way we, we extracted value from Mother Earth. But now we can invest in businesses that's only purpose is to create wealth for its owners. And Warren Buffett has a lovely way of just bringing all these stories to a point where you can go, oh yeah, I get that. Why would you buy gold when you can buy um, Apple? It just doesn't make any sense. So anyway, that's that's the book, The Essays of uh, Warren Buffett, Lessons for Corporate America, the most boring cover you'll see on your bookshelf, but one you'll take down over and over again. And put Jeremy Siegel's book and, and uh, Philip Lynch's, Peter Lynch's book there as well. They're just wonderful. All right, good stuff. I love all of that. Uh, Amory, for you, because Emmett in, talked about every single investing book there, we're going <laughs> to go to... You're uh, welcome, Anne-Marie. So what thanks. have you got? Give us some originality. <laughs> Follow that. Uh, no, for you, we're going to talk about habits instead. So what investing habits would you advise younger people especially to build in order to become great investors? 
Um, I suppose actually is one that we kind of already mentioned, which is the dollar cost averaging. You know, that is a great way to lower risk when you're kind of building into a portfolio, particularly if like all your, if you're just starting off with an index fund, getting in the habit of being like, okay, I'm going to put 50 or a hundred euro in a month, like when my paycheck comes in and kind of automating that process for yourself, I think can kind of make buying stocks less daunting. I, I feel like I f- was quite frightened to do it initially, but I think getting in the habit of doing it and seeing it almost as the equivalent of like putting money in a savings account can help, you know, make it easier for you to then go down the line. Like, okay, I'm going to research in, an individual stock. I'm going to pick them out. I'm going to assemble my portfolio in relation to one another. Um, but I think the kind of second piece of advice, um, which I think we talked about at the end of the year is making sure you're keeping an investment journal, which is recording the factors or the reasons why you have decided to buy a certain stock. Um, and I t- tend to see, like, try and get it down to, like, five bullet points. And some of them should be quantitative and some should be qualitative. You know, have it be, okay, I really like the management team or it's it's a founding CEO and he owns a significant portion of the company. Or, you know, this is in a very innovative industry that is growing rapidly. Or um, this company has a incredible moat. It's not going anywhere. Or it can even be something like, oh, I interact with this company routinely. They have very high-quality products. I can see that continue to be successful. And just writing those down and having them somewhere. And then maybe writing down one or two risks. So you just in the back of your mind go, okay, if this continues to loom large on the horizon, it continues to get bigger. I I have, you know, I can check in with myself. Um, And I think that would make then the process easier of determining, you know, if you're 10 years down the line from holding an asset of if you get into that process of going, is it time for me to sell this? You know, if you have to ask the question, okay, would I buy it today? Having a concrete place for you to go back and say, okay, these are the five reasons I really liked this company. And if you can sit there and say, do you know what? These five reasons are gone or this executive has left or, you know, they there's new competition on the horizon. And I like this product better. I like this company better. Or, you know, there's new innovation and now no one wants to drink coffee anymore. Everybody wants to drink energy drinks, so I shouldn't hold Starbucks. You know, those type of things. I, I think that that, gives you just a bit of confidence, particularly if you're in the early days of investing, because it's quite emotional when you own a stock that all of a sudden plummets 50% off a cliff. And I think when you become a bit worried like that, or a bit nervous, it can mean that you will make irrational decisions. And I think having your thoughts written down somewhere and having them be factual and measured and everything gives you a place to go and check in and say, okay, I am panicked, but four out of these five factors continue to be strong. So I will continue to hold. That's great. And it really distills kind of what we mentioned in the when to sell conversation as well. I love that. Yeah. Okay. I like that. Uh, that's everything for today, folks. I'm just going to give a quick shout out for our sponsors and friends at Vodafone Business before we close out the show. So if you're an Irish business on a digital journey, you must check in with the experts at Vodafone VHub. This is a new digital advisory service. All businesses, businesses of all sizes can get free one-to-one digital support and advice tailored to their business by simply booking a call with one of Vodafone's experts. So search Vodafone B-Hub or check out the Vodafone business website for more information on that. Uh, that's it for today's show. Thanks very much, Emma and Marie, for joining me. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Remember, if you have any questions you'd like answered or elevated pitches you'd like to tackle, make sure to get in touch. You can find us on Twitter at MyWallStreetHQ, on TikTok at MyWallStreet, or simply just email us at pod at MyWallStreet.com. If you're enjoying the show, leave us a review, share us with your friends, and thanks for joining us. We will talk to you next week. Mm-hmm.